The robo-brain is a combination of biological and mechanical components, designed for a number of different reasons, both militant and domestic. But who came up with the design? How practical are they? And what issues does converting a living human brain into the CPU of a machine have on the converters and the converted? The creation of Robobrains was pre-war through a top-secret military project overseen by General Atomics International, Robco Industries, and the United States Army's Robotics Division. The facilities were either under full military control, such as the Sierra Army Depot, or hidden in plain sight beneath company structures. As is seen with the USA Robotics Technology Facility, or RB2851, beneath the Robco Sales and Service Center. The nature of these facilities, which are divvied into many small and discrete segments, ensured that any unwanted visitors didn't see anything they shouldn't have, with soldiers on location on a strictly need-to-know basis, further reducing the chances of any information regarding the Robobrain project being leaked to the outside world. The secrecy of the project was due to the unnatural pairing of biological tissue and mechanical components with the end goal of reducing the machine's decision-making process. Yes, it would be a living brain, but to the developers it was merely another piece of technology or hardware for them to understand and then implement. The Sierra Army Depot, a military installation with a long history of redefining its purpose, finally settled on developing a new kind of cybernetic brain, a living brain modified to suit the technology the project's first step towards completion was through the creation of the Artificial Intelligence Project number 59234, also known as Skynet, a state-of-the-art intelligence software developed to assist the researchers with the project, which is exactly what it did right up until the Great War. On the brink of nuclear war, the scientists were given free reign to do whatever they needed to in order to create their robotic brain-powered machine, which included experimenting with chimpanzees, but also prisoners of war and military deserters as well. Many of their brains were unwillingly extracted and inserted into robotic chassis for further testing. As close as they were to achieving their goal, the project never came to fruition as the inevitable Great War forced the researchers to evacuate the facility, sealing the research and Skynet inside. It was only after the humans had left where Skynet continued the research alone, successfully developing a cybernetic brain that would allow it to transfer its memories and, with the assistance of the Chosen One, make it to the outside world. While the Sierra Army Depot focused on developing a new cybernetic brain, the Robco facility in Boston focused on taking a normal brain and making the technology suit it, rather than cybernetically enhancing the brain like Skynet had. The first brains were taken from primates, typically chimpanzees, but human brains would soon prove superior, which once again led to prisoners of war and military deserters becoming the main source of involuntary donors. Each candidate was carefully chosen, typically adult in nature, intelligent, and suspected to have the best chances of surviving the conversion. Subjects with low intelligence, mental disorders, or just poor brain health were usually terminated, while the aforementioned were strapped down against their will, where a machine would sever any and all connections between the spinal cord and the rest of the body. The brain would then be carefully extracted from the cranial vault along with the cord and carefully submerged into biomed gel for safekeeping. The resulting sample was then put through a process called the Code Conditioning Protocol, where the memory centers were flushed, providing a clean slate for the researchers to work with, before being examined by a trained psychologist to confirm the brain was devoid of all personality and individuality. 
Ideal brains both undamaged during the removal and lacking any personality after the code conditioning, qualified for the final insertion and then assembly before being assigned their day-to-day -day duties. Although this didn't always go as planned, some human brains proved to be more troublesome than others, resisting the code conditioning protocol to preserve a sense of self. Even with multiple wipes, the brain would simply refuse to completely forget itself, and this would lead to termination. Meanwhile, those that were successfully wiped clean would have to undergo regular wipes and maintenance, or else an ersatz personality would develop a false personality, both subpar and inferior to the original, that was, more often than not, unstable, deranged, and violent, although there were few who would develop superior personalities, as rare as that was. What could be considered a flaw in the Robobrain project was found to be useful in certain events where life needed to be preserved, say, in the event of nuclear war. Robert House was one of the few who were given the opportunity to convert themselves into a robo-brain, but refused due to the lack of research and understanding of the side effects. While a group of 10 pre-war millionaires funding the construction of Vault 118 leaped at the chance to extend their natural human lives, as did the scientists of Big Empty and Professor Calvert at Point Lookout. Thanks to Bert Riggs, one of the residents of Vault 118, who previously worked for General Atomics International, the wealthy elite were able to preserve their original personalities and minds, even retaining their original voices through the use of voice synthesizers. It was an all-round clean conversion, or so it seemed. In time, the side effects that Robert House had anticipated began to seep through, and as a result drove the remaining human inside the vault, the Overseer, mad leading to him taking his own life, rather than spend the rest of it living with a bunch of entitled, self-obsessed, borderline insane robo-brains. I don't blame him. Although robo-brains were one of the most advanced forms of cyborgs ever created, they were never mass-produced due to the many issues, not only with unkept brains showing signs of aggression and violence, even in those properly code-conditioned, but also due to the flaws in technology, such as the brain extractors which were incapable of operating at an industrial level, resulting in a limited trial run. However, RB2851 did manage three successful batches, each improving on the last to produce superior cyborgs of varying designs and capabilities. The inclusion of an eye seems to pose no real improvement, and is to me a simple way of making the robo-brain appear more alive, as well as to give humans something to focus on when speaking to them. Those fit for duty, as I already mentioned, were assigned to select locations for both security and janitorial duties, seen frequently in military installations, scientific facilities, and vault tech vaults, distinguishable from one another by a paint job and alphanumerical serial number. The overall design is quite unique. The central processing unit is the brain, contained within an armoured glass dome filled with biomedical gel, which preserves the brain for centuries before decomposition ultimately takes place. It is an obvious weak point, with the possibility of depressurization if the seal is broken, leading to the contents spilling out and the brain being destroyed. The torso is heavily armoured, containing both the primary and secondary power supplies, storage and sensors which provide the cyborg with high-resolution imagery, although the combat inhibitor on the back of the chassis is exposed and, if crippled, will result in the robo-brain attacking indiscriminately in a frenzied rage. Luckily, the robo-brain is capable of turning and can spin around to return fire in the blink of an eye. The arms, also known as a pair of flexible extenders, possess manipulators with opposable claws. Together with very precise servo motors and rotator mechanisms, the robo-brain is able to precisely manipulate its surroundings, even operating weapons and devices intended for human hands. At the bottom, everything rests on two continuous tracks in a tank-like fashion. 
providing a sturdy yet reliable foundation for the robo-brain. Finally, to simplify communications between humans and themselves, they were outfitted with audio receptors and voice modules, allowing them to receive, interpret, and even mimic any normal human voice, which would later have a certain individual questioning the sexuality of the robo-brain. Does a female voice mean a female brain? Probably not. Speaking of audio receptors, robo-brains have an array of onboard software, all pre-war as you can imagine, and does allow the purpose and role of the robo-brain to be adjusted. Maintenance, pest control and security to name a few, with a master computer controlling the network matrix of a certain area, such as the floor of a military installation, or entire facility, such as the Robco building in the capital wasteland. However, there are robo-brains given the power to control the entire security detail, such as the master brain at the vault Tech headquarters in the DC ruins, who not only controls the entire security, but also acts as a sort of kill switch. Combat, on the other hand, was handled by a separate set of routines. When hostiles are identified, the robo-brain engages an array of combat software focused on removing the threat. While relying on preloaded attack patterns, it continuously calculates the odds of combat, as well as determining the hostile target's capabilities, deciding what range of fire to use and what would be the best attack pattern to perform. In the event of sustaining damage, and the analysis of the situation is determined to be futile, the robo-brain will engage a self-preservation command and attempt to flee typically to a specified location, such as a military assembly point. Although the robo-brains that have retained some level of their former selves, as well as those that have developed a new personality, will flee to wherever they think is safe before initiating the self-repair protocol. On the topic of combat, the robo-brain is fully capable of using weapons designed for human hands. More often than not, they would be given military-grade weapons, rifles and shotguns intended for human use, while others were outfitted with built-in laser weapons, smoke bombs, and as a result of the resource wars, some had an integrated mesmatron for subduing enemy soldiers with the intentions of interrogating them. Although this technology was experimental at the time, and is known to cause spontaneous cranial eruption, sometimes completely ruining the chances of gaining enemy intel. Now, after the Great War, they continue their duties, some being repossessed by new factions such as the Brotherhood Outcasts and Enclave, but the majority can still be found, serving their original, yet long-forgotten masters without question. Robobrains are more often than not the result of a prisoner or military deserter being forcefully subdued and converted, although some are voluntarily converted to escape farther time, if only to some degree. They are well suited for combat, sturdily built, and capable of using human weapons if they so choose. Their brains can remain reliable if routinely maintained with regular wipes, although the Great War has put a stop to that almost entirely, resulting in most robo-brains going haywire or developing personalities both dangerous and delusional, which, until new technology or pre-existing methods are revamped to be more permanent, is a fate all robo-brains are destined for. Be sure to show your support by liking the video and subscribing if you haven't already for more Fallout content. If there's anything you would like to see in a later video, leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. With that said, thank you, as always, for watching, and I'll see you in the next adventure. Tisk tisk, I really thought we could be friends.